Hi, um, today's session, the unit we'll be doing is the English legal system, 3.27. And the learning outcome we'll be doing today is um, learning outcome two, which is to understand the rules of statutory interpretation. Um, and my name is Shazia Khan. In the last session, we looked at uh, the elements of uh, a bill becoming a law. So we looked at the uh, the actual uh, procedure through the House of Lords and the House of Commons, and also looked at the, the different stages. We also looked at um, uh, how a bill becomes a law um, and the final stages of that. We then went on to look at the difference between criminal and civil law and private and public law as well, with reference to examples and uh, reference to courts as well. Today, we're going to look at understanding the rules of statutory interpretation and what statutory interpretation is, uh, because there's different rules that apply to different situations. So the learning outcomes is to explain the traditional techniques of statutory interpretation and how they are used and describe um, intrinsic and extrinsic aids. And I will be putting a video on um, later on in regards to um, the, the rules of statutory interpretation. So it might be the golden or the literal rule. So firstly, we look at 2.1, which is to explain the traditional techniques of statutory interpretation and how they are used. So statutory interpretation and introduction. So their statute of law also known as legislation um, and they are written laws of the UK so they are the ones that created and implemented by parliament and enforced by various different uh, authorities prosecuting authorities and so on they are used um, uh, to interpret the meaning of legislation uh, as it's not always straightforward what does it mean when we talk about uh, the meaning of legislation is not always straightforward. Was that to me? What do you think it means? Um... Yeah, sorry, Rachel. Yeah, sorry. What when when it says uh, your meaning of interpretation is not always straightforward in different cases? What do you think that means? Um, it's not clear. So. Yeah. Yeah, like clear. Why might it not be clear? Hmm. Is it the, the um, wording? Is it, because, is it because there's some some things that in that might contradict itself in? Yeah, yeah, and sometimes judges uh, interpret um, the in accordance with uh, you know laws and rules of statutory interpretation so it's different in every given situation you know the law is described and and sometimes um judges interpret it differently as well what the meaning means um so if you would uh, give you an example so if they said that the law relating to um mobile phones whilst driving um you're not allowed to use a mobile, uh, sorry, a mobile device, okay? What could that be? Is it just a mobile phone or could it be other devices? Um, it could be anything that is technology, basically. Yeah, yeah. It could be your sat-nav, couldn't it? Yeah. It could be your iPad. It could be your iPod. You know, it doesn't really make it clear. Uh, if it's a device. So those who draft legislation do their utmost within their extraordinary experience and drafting skills to craft legislation that is clear and unambiguous because that's so important. However, sometimes the written law is not always clear. Typical problems include a failure within legislation to cover a specific point, uh, ambiguity as its meaning, drafting errors, new legal developments and changing in the use of languages. So it's
about that. Sorry about that, Rachel. So, you know, um, typical problems would would be like a failure of legislation. You know, ambiguity is really important when it comes to, you know, making the language clear because, you know, you have to make the other person understand what you are saying. Um, and, you know, some statutes also a big um, problem could be that some statutes date back to the 18th century and use words which have a different meaning today. So would you, just an example, would you understand something that's referred back to language in the 18th century, which we don't understand? No, because we don't know the terminology anymore. Yeah, and the terminology, and also what about the meaning of the language today? Yeah, some of them have changed over time, so we wouldn't understand it. Unless it's so defined it needs... for us. Sorry, what was that? I said we wouldn't understand it unless it's defined for us and they actually tell us what they mean by the word. I wouldn't be able to understand some of the language. Yeah. And yeah, historically... I mean, like in general. Yeah, yeah. Do you think sometimes that's why it's unclear in certain cases? Yeah, definitely. So under, um, under the Interpretation Act, the meaning of various words are helpfully set out, including words important, the masculine gender, things like, you know, shall include things like females. Um, over time, a number of statutory interpretation have developed, providing an important framework for interpretation. And there was a need for the, these rules to be adopted um, and you know the the framework for interpretation, and these all these rules that were adopted under statutory interpretation are um, the literal rule, the golden rule, the mischief rule, and judges' discretion. And because there were so many changes, there was a need for these to come into place, and the the way they used them, these were needed by um, courts. So the first one we're going to go through is the literal rule. And under the literal rule, the words in the statute are given their ordinary and natural meaning. So these will be read literally and do not need to be analysed further uh, for any sort of different meanings disregarding the plain words of the legislation. So what do you mean? They've given their literal meaning. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Can you hear me? Yeah. So what does it mean? I think it means in literal. Um, so word for word. Is it? Yeah. So is it? Is it what the law says clearly? Yeah. They use. Yeah. So what the statutes say is is what they use they don't go above and beyond that yeah they don't change it that's the literal rule <clears throat> and an example of plain reading resulting in a harsh result it was the case of Berryman in 1946 where a rail work a railway worker was killed while doing some oiling on a railway line as a result of there being no lookout point the judge would not grant Mrs. Berryman compensation for her husband's death as the relevant act only stated that lookout points had to be issued for workers relaying or repairing the line. So oiling did not come under either of these two categories. So the, clearly here, the result was quite harsh and unjust. So did do you understand? They didn't say anything about oiling but her husband was killed whilst oiling. So yeah, it was quite harsh, that wasn't it, in that case. Yeah. Um, that, you know, and to overcome this kind of uh, decision and the outcome, the golden rule was there, therefore introduced to modify the literal rule. So it's really important that, you know, um, the golden rule was there to help, to be honest, because I think, um, in in some form of it, I, I don't think it's fair. You know, the literal rule, I don't, it, it wasn't fair in regards to this case where, you know, the 
her husband wasn't given uh, the chance because of what said um and it actually um you know it needed to be changed and the reason it got changed was the golden rule came about and it was there to help modify it yeah. so the golden rule uh, is used to prevent inconsistency and absurdity after the literal rule What do you think, Rachel? Was there need for the golden rules to come into force? For the situation? Yeah. Because of the Berryman case, 1946, and the definition of what it was, was there need for some um, a change and the golden yeah. rule kind of changed things, maybe making it a narrow approach. Yeah, definitely. Fully or widely. So under yeah. the narrow approach, so, so do you think there was a need, yeah? Yeah. It, um, under the narrow approach, the court can choose between the possible meanings of a word. For example, if one meaning is apparent, that meaning must be adopted. So it, it, it gives a little bit of flexibility. Yeah. In the Odler and George case, 1964, the defendant was charged under the Official Secrets Act 1920 with obstruction in the vicinity of a prohibited area. Although the defendant had carried out the obstruction inside the area, the court did not restrict itself to the literal wording of the act and found him guilty. Under the wider approach, so that was the narrow approach, under the wider approach, the courts can modify the words in order to avoid a problem. For instance, where there is an obvious and clear meaning, but this meaning would lead to an absurd result. For instance, in the Reese-Sigwitz case, Um, the defendant had murdered his mother. Under the relevant Act of Parliament, the next of kin, clear, the literal rule would produce an unjust result. The golden rule was applied so that the next of kin would not inherit their state where they had killed the deceased. Do you understand that? That's quite sad, isn't it, really? So, yeah. you know, if... If if the Resigwitz case was under the literal rule, it wouldn't be fair because the son had killed the mother but would inherit all her estate. But under the golden rule, they could have that flexibility and not give him the inheritance. So do you think that's quite fair, Rachel, in that, that instance? Um, yeah. Can we, ex can you explain the instance again, if you don't mind? Hello, Rachel. If it was, if the re -sigs... Yeah. So, he murdered his wife, the defendant, and under the, under the Act of Parliament, his, her next of kin would inherit her estate. So her next of kin was her son. This case went and the judge decided under the literal rule he would get his mum's estate for murdering her. How unfair is that? Yeah, that is quite unfair, especially how he mur murdered his mother. Do you understand that? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and then would benefit from it. Yeah. yeah. So under the golden rule, uh, the judges applied that and they said that the next of kin would not inherit the estate where they killed the deceased. So it, it's it's a good rule to use, isn't it? Uh, the golden rule, because it gives you that flexibility.
you know, because he would he would have benefited. Why why would he need to benefit from that? So it's it's quite sad, really, in that instance. And um, then you've got the mischief rule. Okay, here sometimes statutes can be defined more broadly by the courts to deal with unforeseen loopholes or ambiguities within the legislation, which may prevent the Parliament's original intention being honoured. The application is known. The mischief rule was laid down in the landmark case of Hayden's case in 15 ages need to be considered when interpreting these statutes. These were to examine firstly the common law prior to the Act. Secondly, the locate the mischief or defect in the common law. And thirdly, identify the remedy Parliament meant to propose to eliminate the mischief and to give effect to that remedy. The mischief rule is narrower and then the golden rule, and only applied to determine uh, the mischief and defect that the statute was intended to remedy. The mischief rule uh, was actually a product of time when statutes were minor source of law by comparison with common law, when drafting was no means of an exact process. As it is today and before the supremacy of parliament was established, the mischief rule could often be discerned from lengthy preamble normally included, uh, the mischief rule was regarded by the Law Commission, which reported on statutory interpretation as a rather more satisfactory approach than the other two established. So this was one that was identified as one of the ones that were more satisfactory than the other rules. Um, the judge's discretion is the next one. You Are you still on? Online, Rachel, because I think it kept saying, Yeah, I am. Thing. Yeah, I am. It means the judge's discretion. What do you think the judge's discretion means? Um, I'm not quite sure. So... The judges have by any of the rules discretion to apply any of them rules to any cases they feel they feel like would fit into that case. So it's good to have that discussion. If you're bound by the literal rule, then you know it's in in some instances it's quite unfair, isn't it? Yeah. Especially in the Allen case, you know, where he killed his mother. Why should he have inherited all that money for killing his mother? Yeah, it's like... So for judges to have that discretion, yeah. So for judges to have that discretion, do you think it's a good thing? Yeah. Yeah. Because would, would they see fit where, it, you know, where best way where they need to fit the cases and the rules? Yeah, definitely. Like that case, they could have found like a loophole. Yeah. And basically yeah. taken the inheritance from him. Yeah, even though he committed murder. Yeah. So each of these rules has its imperfections, but it provides judges with the ability to interpret legislation in the best way possible to achieve the result as intended by Parliament. Um, these rules of statutory interpretation provide a coherent and proven framework for the courts to follow to achieve the best possible outcome in accordance with legislation. In exercising their discretion, judges use both intrinsic and extrinsic aids, such as things like Hansard and other statutes, uh, law reports, royal commission reports, and this reduces the risk of statutes being interpreted in a way that contradicts other legislation. So there's a need you know, for statute um, statutes to be used properly and also a need for you know um the fact that you know people um judges are able to interpret things properly because you know um in in some of the rules it, it goes beyond um um you know the powers as well um and 
So it's really, really important um, that judges follow them. Yeah. And it's also to do with, you know, like things like fairness. You know, you've got to make sure that you're being fair. You know, you could say that, you know, you are, you, you think you're being fair, but it's not always the case, is it? So you've got to make sure that you are being fair and you are looking at um, identifying the law, but uh, getting a best outcome from a case. So 2.2 is described intrinsic and extrinsic aids, which we're going to be looking at. So intrinsic aids are matters which help out to put an act into context. Um, you know, so there'll be things, uh, these are things found outside the actual statute. Uh, so they are considered, uh, which may be considered by judges, to help them understand the meanings of a statute clearly. The following intrinsic aid have been regarded as acceptable. So the long and short title, the preamble. Um, so the long title could be things like, you know, Parliament's intention. The short title could be things like, you know, a dangerous dogs act. Um, the preamble is... Um, Older statutes usually have a preamble, for example, the Theft Act um, states that it is an act to modernise the law of theft. And then you've got definition and um, sections of the definition. Uh, you've got um, schedules of the definition and headings as well. Uh, sometimes an act will include a heading as well, which you know people have to refer to when... Uh, dealing with that properly as well. Um, headings are like titles of labels given to specific sections. Uh, schedule, again, is a list of tables and then uh, things like interpretation sections as well would could be part of intrinsic aids. Um, some advantages of intrinsic it's, it's, uh, it's more respectful of Parliament to look. It is quick and easy to look like uh, things like marginal notes, uh, which were helpful in um, cases such as um, the case of Cornwall, CC and Baker. Uh, and marginal notes are brief summaries of comments that appear in the margins of the statute besides specific sections or provisions. And they are actually marginal notes provide a brief overview of the content of the section um, that can be used to aid in interpreting the meaning of the provisions. So, for example, like we said, the theft act, it could have marginal contents. And th why, why do you think these kind of intrinsic aids help I interpret something? Do you think it's a good thing to have intrinsic and extrinsic aids for the judges to refer to? Yeah. It just makes them get a better understanding, doesn't it? So they don't have to refer to anyone else. Uh, so they've got, you know, um, the aids to refer to. Yeah. Some internal aids like interpretation sections and schedules are designed to provide definitions and explanations. So it is common sense to look at them. For example, Section 10 of the Theft Act explain the meaning, meaning of the weapon of offence. There's some disadvantages of intrinsic aids as well. Uh, firstly, problems with wording are not likely to be solved by looking at elsewhere in the Act. Uh, if the words are unambiguous, as in that case of Alan, you know, where he murdered his mum, or very plain but wrong, as in Wiley and Chapman in 1868, Internal aids um, alone are unlikely to be sufficient and if judges were not allowed to refer to anything outside the Act, it would be more difficult for them to avoid unfair or absurd decisions. Then we've got intrinsic aids. So these are aids um, to interpret, uh, are aids to interpretation and are tools of materials found outside the statutes. Um, and they can help in interpreting the meaning um, and purpose of a particular provision or section. Um, and these are found outside, as I've mentioned, and they're there to uh, understand the meaning of statute clearly. So you've got the following intrinsic aid are regarded as acceptable. So dictionaries and legal textbooks. 
And dictionaries uh, of the time the statue was enacted can provide an insight into the meaning and the usage of the words at that time. So courts may refer to contemporary dictionaries to help them interpret uh, the meaning of the word and phrases used in the um, statute. Then you've got um, other statutes as well, and they can, you know, help, uh, you know, uh, provide an insight into the intent and purpose of the current statute. And courts may refer to previous acts to understand the evolution of the law and help interpret the meaning of provisions within the current statute. The next one is reports of the Law Commission and other law reform reports. Um, reports of law reform bodies, uh, such as the Law Commission or other expert committees, can actually provide an insight into problems or issues the statute was intended to address. So courts may refer to these reports to help them interpret the meaning and purpose of a statute. So it's good to have these in place so that we can refer to them. International treaties. Um, and this is uh, international treaties to which the country's signatory can provide guidance on interpretation and application of provisions within the statute. And courts may refer to international treaties to help them interpret the meaning and the scope of uh, provisions within that statute. So what it means. Um, and then you also have things like um, Hansard, which is an official record of debates in Parliament. It can provide an insight into the legislative intent and purpose of the statutes. And courts may refer to Hansard again to help them interpret. And then you've got explanatory notes as well. And some sources uh, of intrinsic aids are dictionaries that we've mentioned, um, dictionaries obvious too, other statutes, earlier statutes, reports of law commission, international treaties, um, and then explanatory notes. So acts passed since 1999 have been accompanied by explanatory notes. And these notes are there to actually summarize and explain the background of the act. Um, intrinsic aid advantages. So using a dictionary is quick and easy, as in the case of Cheeseman and Vogman. <laughs> because it identifies the meaning of the word was at that time. Using Hansard may clarify uh, what Parliament meant. So the whole point about the discussion of what Parliament meant is really important when you look at what using Hansard. Um, and the cases we looked at when using Hansard was the case of Davies um, and Johnson in Lord Henning, where Lord Denning said that not to use it would be likely groping around the dark without putting the light on. So this was really, uh, it was quite um, an important case, Davies and Johnson, 1979. Um, but also the rule was uh, relaxed in, in 1993 in the case of Pepper and Hart. Um, Europe allows background pa papers to be used. So it's sensible for English courts to use them when acts are based on international rules, and that's the case of uh, Fothergill and Monarch Antiges as well. Using using um, intrinsic uh, hindsight may not reveal what Parliament as, as a whole intended. And as I mentioned, uh, the rule was more relaxed in the case of Pepper and Hart, um, which restricts the court to consider what ministers said but Parliament may have decided not to follow the Minister's uh, views. Um, another case uh, that has quite an important meaning, which is not on the slides, is the case of Wilson and Secretary of State for Trade Industry, 2003. Um, and in that case, it was decided that Hansard could be used to look for the meaning of the words, but not read the general debates in order to find out why Parliament thought it was necessary to pass that act. Um, and this appears to limit the use. So um, another one is, another disadvantage um, is uh, what the minister said may not be clear. And the case for that is the case of Deegan, where the court ruled that Hansard couldn't be used because 
what the minister said was not clear. Lord Bingham said that if the statement is unclear, the courts would be tempted to compare one statement with another and run the risk of questioning proceedings in Parliament, which constitutionally they are not allowed to do. There's danger of treating materials that are not part of the Act as having the same status as the Act and therefore undermining the authority of Parliament. So this is the main objection to using external aids, particularly at those other than dictionaries which are less quite objectable. So there is an exercise for you to do for the next session, okay? So if you could... Rachel, are you on? Yeah. Can you hear me, Rachel? Yeah, I'm still here. Yeah. So for the next session, could you just look at some of these cases um, in regards to intrinsic and extrinsic aids? Um, and just we'll just go through them, okay, next week, in the next, sorry, in the next session. When is or the if you just session? research them for yourself, because we've been through, we've got a session tomorrow, but have a look, just have a look briefly at these, because we've gone through most of them already, whilst we're doing the intrinsic, extrinsic aids. So don't, don't you don't need to do them fully, have a look at them, okay, just have a look at them, so you have an idea. Okay. But, OK, um, and a mind map for the exercise which you could use is uh, intrinsic, which looks at the different aids. So explanatory notes, what they are, textbooks, international treaties, interpretation act, previous versions of acts, dictionaries, Hansard, um, and then reports from Law Reform Commission as well. And then you've got intrinsic aid in this diagram on the other side, which is long and short title of the act, the preamble. And it gives you a definition in each box that you could go through. Um, definition section, schedules and punctuation and why these are so important in regards to the act. OK, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to uh, put on a video on one of the rules, maybe the literal rule. And you can just have a look at the elements of statute interpretation. OK. Just let me just pause this. So from the video on the literal rule, it identified the importance of um, the use of these these rules by judges, uh, because you know Parliament is there to create the law, uh, but judges apply it. But must respect uh, Parliament parliamentary sovereignty when performing their role as a judge. But once judges make a decision on Parliament, uh, law is applied. A precedent is created. So when the laws of Parliament are clear, there's no issue. But when the law is confusing and ambiguous, to use these rules. So do you think, Rachel, that there's a need to have these rules in place? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And, you know, when we look at um, the whole aim of statutory interpretation, it is there to arrive a legal meaning of the legislation. So in other words, you know, it conveys that legislation is intent, but the main uh, element is to um, follow and achieve the best possible outcome in accordance to legislation. Sometimes it's difficult, but what, we have these rules in place, uh, the golden, the mischief, and the literal rule. Um, more, the most popular one that is used is, is the golden rule, because the interpretation is easy easy to make the law more clear but also reach to the right decision for the individual um so yeah. we've looked at uh, the different rules of um statutory interpretation uh where the judges have discretion as well we've looked at um the intrinsic and extrinsic age with reference to um dictionaries hansard advantages and disadvantages we finished the session on statutory interpretation now and these are some of the references that you could look at in your own time um have you got any questions no no have you got any questions Rachel? No, I don't. Yeah. No, you don't. Um, the next session for learning outcome three, uh, Rachel, is tomorrow. Okay. Um, and that is learning outcome three. But just let me just see what time that one is, because it doesn't. Um, I think I'm, it's at ten o'clock again. I, I think I'm working tomorrow, but I okay. 
I'd probably see the joy um the recorded. Yeah. Okay, so we've got 10 till 11 tomorrow, and then you've got the uh, learning outcome 3 tomorrow, 10 till 11, then 12 till 1 learning outcome uh, 4, and then we've got the assignment discussion 1 till 2, so we've got three sessions tomorrow, so would you be free at any session? I should be free for 1 to 2, because I have a break at 1. Oh, that's okay. That's the assignment session, so that might be better, but you'll have the recording of everything else. Yeah. Is that okay? Yeah, that's perfect. Excellent. So the resources, any additional resources, all on Moodle for you to go on. Um, and we've done learning outcome one and two today. Tomorrow will be learning outcome three and four and then the assignment session. And I'll see you tomorrow if you haven't got any questions. Is that okay, Rachel? Okay, that's perfect. Excellent. I'll see you at tomorrow's session. Thank you for attending the session. No worries. Thank you. Thank you.